Welcome to the program. The OSC recently warned against a possible escalation in the conflict in eastern Ukraine. Meanwhile, the US Special Representative for Ukraine, Kurt Volker, and the assistant to the Russian President, Vladislav Surkov, met in Dubai recently to discuss the future of the conflict. What does that mean for Ukraine? Joining us in the studio for an interview on the talks in Jason Smart, founder of the 444 for Ukraine NGO and political scientist. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Uh, so, um, first I'd like to point out one um, a bit unsettling fact here. Uh, there was no Ukrainian representative in this talk. And my understanding is not, not the first time, but um, why, why, why is that so? As I recall, this is the fourth meeting between Surkov and Volker, the American representative. And it is a strategic decision, and it's the, clearly the right decision. If we want to have real openness in the conversation between Surkov and his American counterpart, the only way to really facilitate that is that there's a feeling that it's just between them, and they lay out really what the United States position is without interjection from anyone else, and without any sort of, uh, let's say, disruption or somebody saying, but why is this, why is that? It's just an honest conversation between the two parties. T based upon that, he, Surkov, can then understand clearly what the American's position is and what they're really willing to negotiate or not willing to negotiate. And so when they have the next meeting between all the parties involved, it'll be much more clear what is realistic or not realistic for the future negotiations. But doesn't that leave Ukraine out of, the, out of this, this, this? No, I mean, thing? they also meet with the Ukrainians individually as well. I mean, in any negotiations, it's important if you're the deal breaker or sorry, deal maker in this case, and you are the American, uh, it's very important that he clearly understands this, both sides. So when he comes back to them and he says, meets the Ukrainians next, he says, listen, the Russians really will not give any way on this. We have to go firm. Or on this issue, I think there's some leeway. We have to work out another approach. And it can be a much more serious conversation than when they all meet together, because both the Ukrainians and the Russians will understand, thanks to the American mediator, exactly what it is that's negotiable, non-negotiable, and where the hard lines are for negotiation. And talking about what's negotiable or not, uh, one of the key points, and Surkov uh, pointed this out, uh, one of the key topics sorry, was the deployment of a, a possible uh, UN peacekeeping mission to maybe settle the conflict. Um, what are both sides of the talk vision now, right now, so far? So, you know, the, one of the very, very interesting things that's come up after the last meeting, and one thing's discussed, as you know, is the American, the Dubai package, as it was called, the idea of bringing peacekeepers to the region and what that would look like, where they'd be stationed. As you obviously know, a huge point of contention was whether it's going to be along the conflict zone with Ukraine, that is the so-called DNR with the uh, mm -hmm. Ukrainian state, or is it going to be along the Russian border, which was probably realistic where it should be, so that we could prevent future Russian incursions into the country. Uh, and it's a big point of contention, but right now, the way that it was laid out by uh, Volcker was that the United States was very interested in pursuing peacekeepers in the region uh, and also pushing Ukraine to implement some of the changes found within uh, the, the Minsk II talks, which was a big sticking point for Russia. They said, look, the Ukrainians haven't implemented the political points. Why hasn't that happened, such as defederalization or the elections? And right now, I think that the thanks to the fact they met alone, he has a real understanding that, listen, here's what we can do with peacekeepers, here's what we can, what the Russians really demand as far as political changes for Minsk II talks. Uh, and so when he meets with his Ukrainian counterparts next, they can have a much more realistic conversation about where peacekeepers would be, what Russia absolutely rejects, or what Russia might be open to. And uh, I, I hope in the next couple of months it will have a much clearer idea if peacekeepers could come and where they'd be stationed if they did come. Because most of, from the Ukrainian side, there has been this critic, which is a bit widely spread, uh, that it could be some sort of Trojan horse from, from, the, from the Russian counterpart. What's your take on this? Well, absolutely, and there is a very legitimate concern in that. I cannot diminish that. That being said, I think that Russia at this point is really looking for a way to negotiate. And the reason I argue that is for a few reasons. One, it's just simply expensive for Russia to continue this war. It's very expensive. Public opinion is, is not tremendously in favor in Russia. It's not something that helps Putin right now. Let's put it that way. It's not something that's useful. And I think after the Russian elections, which Putin will steal, as predicted, uh, we will can, I would hope to see that he is more willing to negotiate just to end this conflict because he just wants to get out of it. It's no longer what he was hoping it would be. Um, and as, this, uh, as we have the new sanctions that came out just recently, as of uh, yesterday, the, or today, we, we see that this is a process that is not going to get better for Putin if he continues this war of aggression against Ukraine. Uh, so I am really excited and really hopeful that in the next couple of months we'll see some serious changes that will allow for a peaceful resolution of this conflict. Because, yeah, recently Kurt Volker talked about the, the costs uh, of these sanctions against Russia, and he talked to, uh, to put more weight on, on these sanctions. What, are, what is the effective cost of these sanctions towards Russia? Is it really e efficient today? So, it's interesting when we can discuss cost of sanctions. Cost of whom? 
is the question. And for the United States, I think that the cost is bearable. It's something that we can afford to deal with because our economy just simply is not as intertwined with Russia as other countries. Countries in Europe, for instance, uh, have a lot more of a problem with this. The sanctions that Europe has rolled out to various countries, it's been much different there. Uh, especially countries with high unemployment where they don't understand exactly why this would behoove them to be part of these sanctions because they feel that Ukraine is far away from them. They've got their own problems. And if Russia is willing to make a deal, they're willing to make a deal. They need jobs for their citizens. And so when we see sanctions in the long term, uh, yeah, it's probable that the Europeans and the Americans would also like to see peaceful resolution because they would like to take away the sanctions. It is the first meeting of that sort since the U.S. decided to send uh, lethal, lethal weapons to Ukraine. No, so namely the anti-tank uh, javelin missile. How much did it influence the talk and did it influence the talk? I don't think that the influence would have been that great. I think that there was clearly, it would have been mentioned. I have no doubt it would have been mentioned. Russia has been abundantly clear that this is not something they view as a move towards a peaceful resolution. But I think that everything that Volker has said so far has been completely spot on. Listen, these are defensive weapons. These are only used to prevent tanks from invading a country or invading a, a, an area. Uh, if there's no invasion, there's nothing to worry about. If there's no tanks, there's nothing to worry about. And it's very hard for Russia to get around that. I mean, it's true. If, if you're not sending your tanks there, then what could you possibly be afraid of? What is to be scared of? So I think that it is a very strategic move of the United States to supply weapons and correct to do so. Uh, but I, I think that Russia will probably use this as a, a point of leverage in the next set of negotiations. That listen, if you don't supply more weapons, then perhaps we can then speed up this process or we'll be willing to negotiate something else because this could be perceived as an escalation of the conflict. If it starts with javelins, the next step could be something that's not just offensive, but perhaps offensive in the eyes of the Russians. Um, and so I think that if they are seeking a peaceful resolution, they, of course, do not welcome the weapons. But at this point, I think what they've said so far is the public bravado that's necessary when you're negotiating. But I don't think they're terribly concerned by it directly. But this public bravado also from the European point of view or from the, from the Minsk agreement point of view, can it jeopardize the Minsk agreements? I don't think it could really jeopardize. I mean, in the end, I think that Russia is any country or any person that's in negotiations has to take a very strong position on a lot of things. And one of the things that Russia has to take a strong position on is uh, that the United States stays out of it. I mean, that's an essential part of it. It's When it's Russia and Ukraine, that's something that's interesting for Russia. When it comes Russia, Ukraine, and the United States, a, 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 the leader of NATO, uh, it becomes much more of a risk for Russia. And it's an expensive risk. I mean, we, with the sanctions or with the missiles, that all of a sudden, if Russia were to just incur a little bit more, and let's imagine that there's actual Russian casualties as a result of these Javelin missiles, which were being used to defend Ukrainians, uh, then Russia has put itself in a very difficult political situation at home to explain to people why, there's, why their soldiers are dying in Ukraine. Yeah, which is you know, there's also a lack of communication here and a problem in 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 Russia uh, about about this uh, this war. Now then, uh, to conclude this interview about this meeting, the Kremlin called this meeting a way of quote synchronizing watches uh, between the side of the conflict. So now, what does this exactly mean? Until what points uh, are they synchronizing uh, those watches? And uh, once and again, where does that leave Ukraine here? Listen, I think Ukraine is in a good position in these negotiations. It's always good to be the country uh, who is not aggressing. <laughs> if you're the country who's aggressing, you're in a much more difficult position. If you're the victim of, of terror, uh, then it's much, you're in a much better position from day one. And the fact that the European Union, uh, European countries as a whole, not just the European Union, as well as the United States, have been so strongly supportive of Ukraine in this whole process. I mean, clearly laying out that Russia is to blame. And this, keep in mind, this is not isolated purely to Ukraine. Uh, MH17. F tons of European citizens died in this due to Russia's war in Ukraine. So this is a war that has now touched well outside of just the confines of Ukraine or Ukrainian citizens. And so there is a real interest in the entire global community seeing a resolution of this conflict soon. Well, and uh, we are hopefully uh, hopeful that kind, of, that kind of future. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to have you in the studio. Thank you, Alex. Uh, that was Chazin Smart, founder of the FRF Ukraine NGO and political scientist. Thank you for watching the program. Stay tuned for the rest.